Good day, everyone. My name is Jessica Porras, and I'm the Senior Manager for Education and Outreach at CAQH Core. It is my pleasure to welcome you today to our CAQH Core Participant Virtual Meeting on the NCVHS Predictability Roadmap Draft Recommendations. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to mention a few logistical items. A copy of today's slides and recording will be emailed to all attendees and registrants in the next one to two business days. This webinar will be a little bit different from our usual education sessions. We have devoted a major portion of this call to a presentation on the NCBHS Predictability Roadmap Draft Recommendations. We will be doing polling throughout the presentation to get your feedback on the various recommendations. In addition, we will be opening the lines during the open mic portion of the meeting at the end. Attendees can submit comments one of two ways. You may submit a written question or comment by entering them into the questions panel on the dashboard at any time, and we will address your question or comment at the appropriate time. In addition, during the open mic part of the webinar, you may pre press the raise hand button icon on your GoToWebinar dashboard, and we will open your line. I would like to point out that for us to be able to open your line, you will need to participate via phone, or if you're participating via laptop or computer, please make sure you have a mic and that it is turned on. Next slide. Here's an outline of our virtual meeting. We will start off with two brief CAQH core presentations in order to level set. The first one on the CAQH course direction for 2019, and the second on the current charge for this meeting. Then we will have the presentation of the NCVHS Predictability Roadmap Draft Recommendations. After that, we'll dive into our Q&A and open mic segments. Next slide, please. I would like to thank our guest speaker, Alex Goss, for being with us today. We're very happy to have you here today, Alex, and look forward to your presentation. Next slide. Here's a snapshot of who is participating uh, in this meeting. We have broken it down by stakeholder type, as well as by what percentage of our audience is core certified. Um, I'd like to also point out that we have over 50 unique organizations represented today, uh, which is really great, and we look forward to hearing your comments and questions later on in the webinar. Next slide, please. And now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, CAQH Core Director, Aaron Weber. Aaron. Great, thank you, Jessica, and thank you everyone for joining us today. It's been a little while since we've had a participant uh, meeting, so thank you all for taking the time, and thanks especially to Alex for joining us today. Before we get into the details of the presentation, I just wanna give a, a quick overview of um, some of the uh, goals that we have looking into 2019. Um, we were pleased to see some of the recommendations in the roadmap very much aligned with uh, some of the same items we were thinking about. Um, hopefully many of you were able to attend our town hall call last week where April Todd, our Senior Vice President of Core and Explorations, gave a high level overview of our 2019 direction. But on slide seven, um, I will highlight um, a couple of our key goals for the coming year, um, and really we're thinking out about three years at this point. Um, the first is really focused on our role as the operating role author, um, with a particular focus over the next year or so on prior authorization, attachments, value-based payments, acknowledgements, um, and various rule enhancements um, that are needed as well. We will continue to offer and serve as the gold standard certifier for operating rules and their underlying business standards. Uh, we plan to really focus our effort on increasing certifications around the phase three EFT and ERA rules, the phase four rules, and particularly with the Medicaid and dental communities. We are also looking um, at approaches to um, target recertification over time right now Core certification is a single snapshot in time, and as um, some of the rules have um, been out for several years now, um, there is a need to uh, reconfirm um, adherence to the rules with um, some of the core certified entities. 
Um, and the last one is really focused on evolving our model of rule writing certification to drive farther multi-stakeholder value. And one way we're focused on that um, as outlined on slide eight, and that is really thinking about how best to increase the pace and the impact of the operating rules. Um, as you are all well aware, um, the current rule development process takes on average about one and a half to two years. Um, and you know the, the pace of technology in our industry is really accelerating. So um, we are looking at ways on how we might move things forward more quickly. Um, some of the things that we are, are looking at is tightening the timeline and scope of the advisory groups, which really set the priorities for the rule development process, looking at how agile and lean methodologies could increase the pace and output of rules. And we're identifying opportunities where um, there may be a way to address some of the more contentious topics where uh, we might not be able to get consensus amongst all of the participants right off the start, um, but working with smaller groups of stakeholders committed to piloting solutions um, to enable measurement of ROI, which could then be used to encourage broader industry adoption. And slide nine really outlines kind of a, the traditional approach that we're using now. It's very linear, um, and part of that is why it takes so, so much time. And then thinking through how can we do this more quickly to allow for shorter iterations of rule development, more piloting, more capturing of ROI to enable broader adoption. Um, so we look forward to um, sharing more with you over the next year on, on how we plan to implement this. Um, and I think you'll hear some of the themes of these slides echoed in Alex's presentation uh, later on as well. I'm now just going to talk a little bit about um, the work that NCBHS has been doing and how CORE has been engaged over time. Um, moving to slide 11. Um, the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics um, is a federal advisory committee to the Secretary of HHS, and um, they have worked um, over the past two years to identify opportunities to increase the predictability and impact of new standards and operating rules for the industry based on feedback that they had been receiving. Uh, CORE has been actively engaged in this initiative um, and intends to participate in the NCBHS Subcommittee on Standards hearing in December, um, as well as providing written comments on the recommendations that Alex will walk through today. Uh, we are really looking today and via a follow-up survey later this week to um, hear your thoughts on these recommendations and the impact that they may have on the industry um, to inform our own um, our, our, the core comments and feedback to NCBHS. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of alignment with the recommendations in terms of advancing workgroup processes to be more responsive to industry needs. Um, speeding up the pace of rule development while also maintaining the quality and the impact of the rules. Identifying ways to address more challenging and potentially impactful uh, topics through piloting and, and other approaches and the importance of measuring ROI to drive adoption over time. Slide 12 just highlights how CORE has been engaged with the NCBHS predictability roadmap efforts over time. Uh, in 2017, we participated in some information gathering calls, um, as well as a visioning exercise, and attended the CIO forum uh, earlier this year as well to um, hear the feedback from the industry directly. Alex will talk, um, I'm sure, in more detail about NCVHS's next steps. Um, they are um, right now uh, providing a lot of education to the industry on their recommendations, and, and they will be holding a public hearing on December 12th and 13th, as well as accepting written comments from the industry. Um, these comments will be utilized to finalize their recommendations to the Secretary of HHS. Um, kind of in parallel, we are holding this webinar today with our participants to um, both share these draft recommendations with you and get some preliminary feedback and reaction from you. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be putting out a more detailed survey later this week to solicit additional feedback to help inform our comments. Um, uh, there are a couple, four questions here um, that uh, I know NCVHS is looking for feedback on, um, and we would like you to keep in mind as Alex walks through these recommendations, thinking about how, whether and how they would improve the predictability of standards and operating rules, 
are there more recommendations that may be crucial to achieve predictability? And then specifically thinking about the value proposition of each recommendation, are there potential unintended consequences from any of these recommendations and how could they be mitigated uh, with modifications to the recommendations? So with that, I will turn it over to Alex Goss, who is the chair of the subcommittee on standards within NCBHS to um, walk through these draft recommendations and some of the history behind them. Alex? Thank you so very much, Erin. It's uh, been great to have CAQH so involved in the work over the last couple of years. If we can go to the next slide. Um, a lot of the, the basis for what I'm going to talk about is um, been bubbling up since we had adopted the initial implementation of HIPAA. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the historical review on how we got here, but I want to spend most of the time uh, going through the draft recommendations, enabling us to have a robust Q&A um, after uh, we get through all of the presentation and polling aspects. There will be a uh, available to you a written summary of uh, that goes along with the slides that we'll try to get out to um, all the attendees as well. Next slide, please. So the NCVHS predictability roadmap, as you heard Aaron say, it's about you know trying to keep up with the pace of change in our technology and our business models. And it was very clear uh, that uh, from industry feedback that we receive as a federal advisory committee uh, through our efforts uh, uh, as a part of HIPAA and also the ACA, uh, that the industry's needs are not being met by the current pace of development of standards, maintenance of standards, and operating rules, uh, and uh, having those adopted and then uh, implementation to occur. As you may recognize, HIPAA is 22 years old, and we've really only had two versions um, of HIPAA standards adopted to date. And the, there's an impact to business and an erosion of the, of the efficiencies and administrative simplification, which HIPAA was initially intended to achieve, uh, by having the delays in being able to get more timely standards uh, and operating rules adopted um, after they've been developed. And so we're trying to figure out now how to modernize the framework uh, that we implemented over 20 years ago. And more specifically, um, we have uh, taken a very focused effort over the last 18 months, as you saw uh, by Aaron's slide reflecting how CAQH Core has been a very active and engaged participant in NCVHS, uh, taking uh, feedback Back that has been uh, generated since the original HIPAA implementation uh, to uh, just this year. And over the 20 years, the themes are pretty strong as to what industry needs. And so I'll be talking a little bit about that in the subsequent slide. But for now, let's go to the next slide and talk about what the vision is for the predictability roadmap. We'd like to see covered entities and business associates able to use up-to-date HIPAA standards, and I use that term to inclusive of operating rules, and to use them consistently, garnering increased value from the standards by avoiding one-off workarounds, and to reliably know when updated versions will be updated and adopted in time to prepare systems, resources, and processes. Organizations need to understand what's coming down the pike and how to be able to schedule their precious human financial and technical resources to meet the, those new and emerging standards, which should be meeting the business needs of the marketplace. If you go to the next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about the overarching process to set some context for what happens today as a result of various laws and regulations and organizations that have been named to play within the overall ecosystem of getting a HIPAA standard developed and adopted. So please keep in mind when I say the word standard, I am incorporating operating rules. Standards and operating rules are developed or updated in response to business needs. Industry brings forward their needs for considerations into the consensus-based processes. Operating authoring entities provide additional business collaboration to constrain standard implementation guides that garner further efficiencies from the use of mandated standard. There's a slightly two-step process, uh, slightly different 
two-step process that happens. So from a SDO, a standards development organization, uh, like X12 or NCPEP would uh, receive change requests from the industry. They would uh, incorporate that work through their processes, it, consider that work finalized, advance it into the designated standards maintenance organization process uh, for review and recommendation to the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, who has a formal hearing and makes a recommendation to the Health and Human Services Secretary that enables them the internal processes to kick off that results in a pub uh, regulation being published for the industry. Operating rules, as you probably all know, do not go through the DSMO process, but instead come straight to NCVHS for uh, promulgation uh, based upon recommendation. Uh, additionally, WEEDI is involved in the process, is also supporting advisory um, policy advisory groups. Next slide, please. As Aaron showed you on an earlier slide, there were several steps of information gathering, uh, visioning exercise, and also a CIO forum. Uh, a number of the organizations that um, you see on the screen were involved, plus a whole bunch more of entities uh, participated in the various information gap efforts, with the CIO forum providing some really important, um, I think, summary of really underscored the issues that we're trying to address. And we held that forum um, as reflected on slide seven in May of 2018. The CIO forum really validated the benefit of having transaction and operating rule standards and that significant efficiencies had been achieved since the pre-HIPAA paper-based days. And an opportunity exists to garner more benefits by revising or enhancing the current approaches to keep pace with the strategic needs of the healthcare industry. There were seven points that really uh, came through loud and clear from the industry. Improving the current processes is needed, but we needed to do so with consideration of tomorrow's business models and technology capabilities. There is value of avoiding, you can go back a slide please, uh, value of avoiding technical debts and throwaway work. Having a focus of putting the patient at the center. That diverse end user engagement in standards development and operating rule development and governance is essential and needs to be made less painful and expensive. Smaller iterations at a predictable cadence that supports backward compatibility is needed. Becoming more evidence-based in standards development by incorporating empirical testing and pilots that generate learning and support better development process is also important. All actors in the ecosystem need to be clearly obligated to comply with standards and operating rules and data protection obligations. In closing on the themes that came out of our uh, information gathering, the robust dialogue really reflected strong agreement that there is no longer a meaningful differentiation of clinical and administrative data, and it's time to create a path to integrating the standards. Having received that feedback um, over uh, a year or so, that really underscored a lot of the themes that we've heard since the initial implementation phases, the standards subcommittee compiled three outcome goals with a set of draft recommendations, calls to action, and measurements. I'm gonna go over those for you. Um, if we go to the next slide. Um, it's, it's important to understand that we realize that this takes a village to improve the process. The world that we lived in in the early 90s is very different than the world we live in today from a policy, a collaboration, and a technology perspective. So it's time to modernize and it's a time to converge. And our recommendations that I'm gonna be going over really fall into three categories. Improvements for the federal processes, improvements for the SDOs, and improvements in, in stewardship. Let's go to the next slide, please. So the first, so the, what I'm gonna be showing you today is a series of uh, 23 recommendations that are broken into three categories. The first one is around improved education, outreach, and enforcement. 
that will promote efficient planning and use of adopted HIPAA standards and operating rules. The second one is a policy or policy levers that will successfully support industry process improvement. The third one is the regulatory levers to enable timely adoption, testing, and implementation of updated or new standards and operating rules. So keep in mind as we're going to be going through the recommendations here today that what we want to be able to do is have a regular cadence so that business knows what's coming down the pike, where to pay attention, and how to plan for and implement the standards and operating rules so that they get further administrative simplification efficiencies and the process enables the data to flow more effectively through the various portions of our uh, reimbursement methodologies. Next slide, please. So what we're going to do today is I'm going to first cover recommendations. There are two slides on that. Then we're going to do some polling. Then I'm going to cover the calls to action, do some polling, then get into measurement. So uh, the best way that I've been finding to go through this is to talk to you about the recommendations first and to cover the first column. And then we'll go to the next slide, finish up the first column, then we'll come back to this one, and then we'll iterate to get through these uh, 12 recommendations. We attempted to put some time frames around when we thought the three acti activity areas should be accomplished. We recognize that there is a, 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 a certain degree of lift or lead time that's needed to accomplish some regulatory levers. So that's why they ended up in the third column. We know that some of the activities uh, are probably a lighter lift, and they're at the beginning in the education activities. The recommendations in some cases overlap and work together. So it's important to think of this as a body of work. That's why we ask two general questions about the magnitude and maybe what we're missing in our recommendations as a, in, in total. And then we also want people to think about discrete recommendations and what they mean. As I'm going through this, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of commentary um, on each of the items and where they came from. So in recommendation one, which is in the first column, and we look to have happen within the next two years, uh, HHS should increase transparency of their complaint-driven enforcement by publicizing information and use all appropriate means to share de-identified information about complaints to educate the industry. We found, especially when you look at the OCR and other federal initiatives, the more information that can be disseminated, the more the industry is capable of absorbing it and garnering efficiencies and move forward collectively towards an end goal. Recommendation two, HHS should comply with the statutory requirements for handling complaints against non-compliant covered entities and process enforcement actions against those entities and their business associates, with information being publicized about the status of those complaints to the extent permitted by law. So if, the, if others in the industry can understand what not to do, that makes it better and easier for all of us to be on point as we move forward. We've had a lack, uh, the perception is that there's a lack of enforcement really happening, and if there is enforcement or corrective action plans being put forth, that that information is not being broadcasted uh, and, and thus is not useful to help everyone else uh, garner more efficiencies. Could we go to the next slide, please? To recommendation three, I'm sorry, seven. We would expect that HHS regularly publish and make available guidance regarding the appropriate and co correct use of the standards and operating rules. Please note that in this, we're not looking for the SDO organization's uh, interpretation or clarification process to, to be stepped on by HHS in this case. We're really looking for policy and lessons learned that could be elevated for the industry as a whole as more effective guidance to help us all garner the, the longer term efficiencies. That was the third of the three recommendations within the education outreach and enforcement column. So I'm gonna return now to uh, the second column at the top. We're gonna start with recommendation three. And I'm gonna do a little setup on this one before I read the recommendation. 
for those of you who've been around the industry for a while, like I have, you may remember that in the in the days when we were even trying to eliminate uh, multiple versions of paper-based claims and processes, uh, that we had um, identified a clear need that as we move toward electronic data interchange, we needed a way to make sure that the the data content and the and the technologies all work together, and that we had a well balanced set of views in in governing the process of uh, standards development. And it was envisioned under the HIPAA Act that we would, that the HHS would have several advisors that they would work with. Um, and the thought process around how to coordinate adoption, how to coordinate maintenance, really centered around having an organization named in regulation that would provide that central hub. And we envisioned that everybody would go to that central hub and submit their change requests and that we would have a really well working machine that would take in change requests, farm it out to the applicable SDOs that were interested or had an impact by the business need that had been presented. And then the development work would take place within the normal SDO process and then would bubble back up into the, to the central hub for final blessing and advancing it into NCVHS's process for final public vetting before it would be taken on for regulatory action by the secretary. It wasn't how we envisioned it not what actually turned out, folks. What we found was that uh, most people request their changes directly of the SDOs. We also found that in order for a stewardship organization to be effective, they need to really have clear authority and funding to do the job. As such, recommendation three is that HHS should disband the designated maintenance standards organization yeah, and work with its current members for an organized transition. As I've been saying in some of my other presentations, it doesn't mean that we necessarily have to throw the DISMO out totally. Maybe it's time for DISMO 2.0, but we really should address some of the underlying shortcomings of how it was set up originally to enable the good people that have been working on the, uh, in the DISMO since it was created um, to be more successful and bring more value to the, to the market. Recommendation four, HHS should enable the creation of an entity tasked with oversight and governance or the stewardship of the SDO processes including evaluation of new HIPAA standards and operating rules. They should provide financial and or operational support to the new entity to ensure its ability to conduct effective intra-industry collaboration, outreach, evaluation, cost-benefit analysis, and reporting, taking into account ANSI essential requirements for any ANSI accredited organizations. These would also provide consistency to governance of all the standards and operating rule entities. Recommendation five is that HHS should conduct appropriate rulemaking activities to give the authority to a new governing body replacing the DISMO to review and approve standards. Can we go to the next slide, please? In recommendation eight, we'd like to see HHS published regulations within one year of a recommendation being received or accepted by the Secretary for a new or updated standard or operating rule. This is already in accordance with what's permitted under statute. So the process you can kind of envision it is this. Business process co request comes through, the SDO or the operating rule authoring entity makes the changes in their consensus-based manner. They produce a, a final paper uh, work product that comes to, HA, to NCVHS for vetting. We make the recommendation as NCVHS to the Secretary of HHS to adopt the updated or new operating rule or standard. And within one year, the Secretary would have the regulations published. Recommendation nine, HHS should ensure that the operating division responsible for education enforcement and the regulatory processes is appropriately resourced within the department. As you can see, if we're going to ask HHS to be more time efficient in producing 
regulations that adopt standards and operating rules, we need to make sure they've got the, the tools in their toolbox to do the job, just like we like to make sure that the stewardship organization, such as DISMO currently or its replacement or 2.0 version, is also set up for success in our current marketplace. Can we go back to the prior slide and start with recommendation six in the third column? Now we're pivoting to the regulatory levers. This is a little bit of a long one. SDOs and operating rule authoring entities should publish incremental updates to their standards and operating rules to make them available for recommendation to NCVHS on a schedule that is no greater than two years. Publication of a new and updated standard is intended to mean the cycle of preparation that meets the ANSI requirements, if applicable, for maintaining or modifying a standard or operating rule, including the consensus process, necessary governance compliance, and readiness for submission to NCVHS. That means that from start to finish, to give us a new version, we'd like to see it happen within two years. And that you would then bring forward a recommendation to NCVHS, who should then also be aligning its calendars to support the SDO and operating authoring entities to review and deliver its recommendations within six months. and that we should have HHS adopt those recommendations on a regular schedule as we just discussed. Let's go to the next slide, please. And talk about recommendation 10. We'd like to see HHS adopt incremental updates to standards and operating rules. And in accordance with the existing statute, the adoption of modifications is permitted annually if a recommendation is made by NCVHS and if updates are available. This recommendation would work with the prior cadence of, eight of NCVHS responding within six months to something brought forward by the operating rule authoring entities, or SDOs. Recommendation 11 is that HHS should publish rulemaking to enable the adoption of a floor or a baseline of standards and operating rules. This rulemaking should also consider other opportunities that advance predictability and support innovation. So keep in mind that we'd like to see the recommendations I'm going through right now, the regulatory levers, in place sometime, you know, in the next couple of years, 2021, 20, 2024, somewhere around there. And that what we would want to see happen is the ability for us to say, here's a new floor, not the ceiling that we have today. So that the highest we can go without getting an exception is whatever is adopted under rulemaking. We'd like to see it become the opposite and become the foundation or the, the baseline for whatever we do so that what can happen is willing trading partners can then advance to newer versions if they want to, but that we can then slowly increment the marketplace forward as innovation and technology and best practices and business adoption happens. We can then continue to upgrade our floor without impacting those who want to run a little bit harder and faster. In recommendation 12, we should enable volunteer use of newer and updated standards, uh, prior to their adoption through the rulemaking, testing new standards to enable the voluntary adoption may be explored using a current testing alternative. And I can't read the bottom part of that one. That might be my challenge there. Uh, the, this is, I believe, supposed to sync up with, um, our uh, ISA processes that are currently used um, and in support of innovation. It would also leverage the ability for trading, willing trading partners to actually exercise a process that's already in place above and beyond what was permitted within the statute. So I'm gonna stop there and I believe we're gonna switch now to a set of polling requests. Yes. That is correct. Thanks, Alex. Um, so this is the first question for the audience. Um, we, as we are developing our comments and feedback to NCVHS, we want to understand from the core participants whether um, if more frequent, maybe not greater than two-year updates to the operating rules specifically would be beneficial to you, your organization. Um, so go ahead and select your response here. Uh, we'll give it a little bit of time. 
And again, today we're going to ask um, probably about seven different polling questions um, to get some initial reaction to the uh, recommendations Alex is presenting. And then on Thursday, we'll be sending out a uh, survey that will ask more detailed uh, questions like, do you support a CAQH core comment that says related to the NCBHS recommendations? So here we're just trying to get some initial sense to help develop those comments. Later this week, we'll ask for specific feedback on proposed comments. Um, so give it another minute or so, and then um, we can close it up. And it's possible, Jessica, I'm not going to be able to see the polling results. No, no worries, Aaron. Oh, nope. I see them now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and and I um, just kind of to give a sense of, of where we are on these, um, it, it looks like we're at about, um, and are we able to, yeah, there we go. Um, it looks like about half um, half of you all felt that yes, um, more frequent updates would be beneficial, and then the other half of you are um, a little mixed in terms of where you are. Um, we do ask that if you have additional comments or thoughts related to the question, that you can um, just insert a comment in the questions panel for us to to see. So Aaron, this is Alex. And to add on to your questioning process, I can imagine that sort of off the cuff, it's kind of hard to know whether or not it Absolutely. would be beneficial. And I think that you know a lot a lot of organizations deal with code set updates uh, or uh, policy reimbursement updates every year. There, there's sort of a mm -hmm. routine life cycle around those and a methodology that also helps make them a lot more bite sizable than maybe what we've experienced in the past with trying to create standardization. And so we're hoping that as people think about updates to operating rules or standards, they think about the fact that they'll be on a regular schedule, they'll be more bite size compared to like a full upgrade like we might have when we went from, let's say, 4010 to 5010. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. And then let's go ahead and move on to the next question. I know it takes a, a little bit to toggle in between these. Um, as we're getting there, um, the next question relates to um, recommendation number 11, I believe, um, which is asking, um, you know, Alex talked about a floor and not the ceiling. Um, and one of them, a core guiding principle has always been that the rules will not be based on the least common denominator, but rather will encourage feasible progress. And then specifically that there's an underlying assumption with the core rules that they are a floor and not a ceiling and certified entities can go above and beyond the rules. And a great example of this is the response time requirement. There's a requirement for 20 second response time, re response time um, for certain transactions such as eligibility. Um, certainly any organization could go above and beyond and have an even quicker response time than that, but the floor is the 22nd uh, real-time response. Um, so this polling question um, is asking if your organization has ever gone above those minimum operating rule requirements, um, particularly for those organizations that are core certified. Um, so give it just another couple seconds um, and then we can go ahead and display those poll findings. Um, and as we bring those up, it's really great to see that um, almost two thirds of those on the line, um, their organizations have gone above those minimum requirements in the operating rules. Um, so that's a great sign that this is a um, strong guiding principle that um, organizations are taking advantage of. And I think we have one more polling question here. And we'll bring that up. Um, you know, Alex mentioned, um, and, and um, I also mentioned in my presentation, that we are 
looking for opportunities to do um, more piloting of new standards and operating rules um, to help measure our ROI, understand impact um, before maybe they are mandated across the industry. Um, and so we're curious, is, would your organization, obviously there's a lot of factors that go into making a decision like this, um, but, but kind of your gut reaction, is this something you would be interested in participating or supporting, um, depending on your organizational type? We do have a not applicable here if your organization may not be a user of the standards and operating rules. Why don't we go ahead and close that poll up and take a look at the results. I'm getting a bit of a preview here, and, and I can see that um, a little over half are unsure, and I'm sure that largely has to do with the scope and uh, the requirements of the pilot itself. Um, but I think it's telling that um, very few are, are, are just saying no outright. So I think that there is some opportunity here to um, do some early piloting before we move towards um, industry mandates. Great. With that, Alex, I think I'll turn it back to you to talk about your call to actions. Great. Thank you, Erin. Exciting to see the polls in real time. Yeah. So we're going to start with a uh, call to action A. When we're ready, I'm not, I think we're switching back. I just want to make sure I'm not missing something. I think it might just be taking a minute to flip between the polls and the slides. Yeah, give us a second. We're almost there. <laughs> All right, so uh, we're going to do this similar to the last one. So if you can go to the prior slide, we're going to start with a call to action A uh, in the first column. Uh, so again, we're going to be staying within the methodology of, or thinking, um, huh, there you go. That works. Uh, we've got three columns. Envision sort of is when we'd like to see these things in place. Please note that's not when we want to see them started, but we want to see them actually coming to fruition within these timeframes, if not sooner. So in the education, outreach, and enforcement category, we'd like to see health plans and vendors identifying and incorporating best practices for mitigating barriers to the effective use of transactions, determining which issues are the most critical, and prioritizing the use cases. So think of this as a way for the lessons learned of the health plans and the vendors with their provider partners in bringing back enhancements that could continue to improve the overall transaction sets and operating rules. You'll notice that in this section, they're called calls to action because this is part of the, the, the thought process around it takes a village to keep the, uh, the, the circle of, of healthcare moving in that the first set of items that I went over are recommendations to NCVHS's primary audience, which is the secretary. And those are recommendations for them to take action. In this case, we're covering the calls to action uh, because we do know that we need to have an active involvement of the private sector uh, to ensure that this process can continue to evolve. And that private sector role, um, as HIPAA specified, includes the work group for electronic data interchange advisory role related to HIPAA. And we think through its work group structure, it should continue to identify issues and solutions, publishing white papers and advising on agreed upon policy implications and best practices related to the use of standards and operating rules. Um, as CAQH has been a very actively engaged participant in our journey over the last 18 months, as has Weedy. Uh, to the next slide, uh, to go over recommendation, or I'm sorry, call to action E, so it might be up, there we go. We would like to see the standards development organizations consider collaboration with the private sector to plan and develop outreach campaigns with the intent to increase the diversity of participants in the standards development work groups. Keep in mind, again, standards development in this case includes the CAQH core's operating rule authoring entity role, that it is important that um, uh, for all of us to ensure that we've got the end user, the providers, the clinicians, and their office staff voices in the mix, and they're often extraordinarily difficult to get engaged within the development process. 
And to help with that, we would like to see in, in call to action F, leadership from the public and private sector commit to membership in the organizations, assigning the appropriate subject matter experts to participate in the development and update process, and facilitate improvement to operations as needed. This may enhance diversity of the representation in the SDOs so that content changes meet a cross-section of stakeholder needs. I'd like to go to the prior slide, and let's talk about the policy levers that we'd like to see in place in our calls to action. That HHS and the SDOs should identify and fund a best of class third party compliance certification validation tool recognized and approved by each SDO to assist in both defining and assessing compliance. That HHS should develop and test criteria for certification and build a program to enable third party to qualify to conduct the validation testing by demonstrating their business value. To implement this recommendation, HHS should look at successful precedents, such as how the ONC certification program was developed for promoting interoperability and the e-prescribing requirements, which was a joint effort of HHS, NIST, and the SDOs. This call to action really talks about a, a strong public-private collaboration and making sure that we have good rules of the road for uh, folks to verify that they're being compliant. The next slide gets into rec uh, call to action G. And that we'd like to see public and private stakeholders as a part of this policy lever column collaborate to design a single coordination, coordinated governance process. So this recommendation, this call to action goes back to our recommendation that we talked about earlier about the DISMO. Governance should include detailed and enforceable policies regarding business practices, including policies for identifying and implementing best practices in such an organization. Let's go back to the prior slide and pivot to our final column and calls to action regulatory levers. Item D is that HHS should fund a cost benefit analysis of HIPAA standards and operating rules to demonstrate their return on investment. And that HHS may consider collaborating with or supporting any industry initiatives pertaining to such cost benefit studies to increase data contribution by covered entities and trading partners. As you may notice that this is an HHS related item, but it's in a call to action because we're not thinking necessarily the government has to take this on, but this may be more of a private sector area. And uh, in, in the past, I've noted CAQH cores index uh, might be the place for this to happen. But if we're going to do it, we wanna make sure that we have the most robust data available to get us the best information on the ROI possible. And the last call to action, item H on the next slide, is that HHS should continue to publish a universal dictionary of clinical, administrative, and financial standards that are or will be available for use. Specifically, we're referring to the ISA, and hopefully you've all are very familiar with that with the HIPAA transactions, administrative and financial ones are included in the um, ISAs. That concludes the calls to action for the industry, and I believe you may be going back to the polling stage. Yes, thank you, Alex, um, and, and thanks for walking through those calls to action. Our first question relates to the call to action item C. Um, does your organization believe there is a need for mandated certification for operating rules? Um, as a reminder, certification for operating rules right now is currently voluntary. Um, so, is voluntary certification sufficient? Um, should there be a mandated certification program led by HHS? Yes, maybe there should be a mandated certification program, but led by the industry or other. Um, what is your kind of initial reaction to that um, call to action? And we'll give it a couple minutes um, to come through, and this again will help inform our feedback to NCVHS. And why don't we go ahead and close that poll. 
And here again, this question um, was focused on operating rules. Um, and it looks like about 44% said voluntary certification is sufficient, um, followed by mandatory certification led by HHS. Um, and about 20% supported mandatory certification led by the industry. Um, so we look forward to any follow-up comments from that question. Uh, next question. And as we're pulling that up, um, this question relates back to Alex's comment related to the CAQH index, which um, most of you, I'm sure, are aware, tracks industry adoption of the uh, HIPAA-mandated standards. Um, would you support expanding the scope of the index to collaborate with HHS on cost-benefit analysis and ROI? And that, again, relates to call to action item D. So we'd be very interested in your feedback here. I think we can go ahead and close this one. Seeing a very strong trend here towards, yes, um, almost 80% uh, supporting uh, expanding the scope of the index to collaborate with HHS. Um, and then as a follow-up question, you know, um, all of these initiatives, whether it be operating rule development, the index, uh, we do rely on your organization's participa participation and commitment. Um, would your organization, if you're not already, be interested in participating in the CAQH index? Um, and um, if, if you do select yes here, we will likely follow up with you offline. And I think we can go ahead and close this one as well. Um, you can quickly share the results. It looks like about 33% um, said yes, they would be interested in participating. So we greatly appreciate your interest there. And those that are unsure or need more information, um, our Director of Research and Measurement will likely reach out and share some information about the data collection process and how to get engaged with the index. I think that ends this series of questions, and I'll go ahead and turn it back to Alex to talk a little bit more about measurement. Thanks so very much, Erin. So the last slide I'm gonna be going over as far as our core set of recommendations, no pun intended there, sorry, um, is the, I'm gonna talk about some of the measurement items that bubbled up as a part of us being more evidence-based and how we uh, continue to advance our, our aim towards administrative simplification. So from a, an improved education outreach and enforcement perspective, we'd like to see HHS publicly and regularly disseminate the results of its enforcement program to promote transparency, opportunities for education, and benchmarking. From a policy lever perspective, in the middle column, M2 and M3 uh, are included. M2 is at HHS and stakeholders participating in the new governance process should establish metrics for monitoring and performance assessment of the new entity and oversight and enforcement of the SDO and operating rule authoring entity deliverables and performance. This would really help having overarching orchestration and keeping the process moving along in a way that was able to be assessed from a fact-based perspective and give us more of, a, uh, of assurance for the predictable cadence of delivery of standards um, transactions. M3. Uh, straddling the private sector to the federal uh, sector, uh, the, uh, public and private straddling, uh, we have a role for the stakeholders' voice to make sure that it's getting heard before things are really taken into the black back box, excuse me, black box process of the federal rulemaking obligations. So we would continue to provide that forum. Those are the three measurement items that we included. Uh, we are looking for feedback, um, not only on the magnitude of these changes, if they really create predictability, but if there are other items that you think we should be including, we'd like to see those as well. I'd like to move on to the next slide to give you an overview of our next steps in our timeline. We vetted the uh, 
recommendations I've just gone over with you for the first time in September with the full committee of National NCVHS. We've distributed that slide deck broadly, widely with a big call out for anyone and everyone to give us comments that we've provided for over two months of industry review, vetting, and uh, input uh, gathering. December 12th and 13th, as you heard Aaron say previously, there will be a, a hearing. This will not be your traditional hearing in the sense of everybody comes and makes their you know, short remarks that summarizes their written testimony. Rather, um, we're asking them, of course, to submit their written testimony uh, by December 7th, but what we are doing is we're going to have more of a roundtable discussion forum uh, for this uh, hearing. We will incorporate the feedback of all of the written testimony and the verbal discussion into uh, a revision process with the goal it's, gonna, it's a pretty lofty goal, but our goal is to bring forward uh, a revised set of recommendations to the February 6th and 7th full committee meeting, and hopefully leading to our ability to submit a letter to HS and to the industry in the first quarter of 2019. Next slide, please. I hope everyone will support CAQH Core's testimony readiness but I also encourage you to consider that you exercising your vo voice on your own right, that you can submit, anybody can submit comments, and in our slides, it shows you where to submit them. We ask that you include a subject line, uh, predictability roadmap, your name, email, and organization, and address the four questions that Aaron had showed us earlier, with the first two being general and the second two being specific to each recommendation, call to action, or measurement item. I believe that brings me to the end of my slide deck. And I believe we may actually be on time to have a nice robust Q&A session. <laughs> That's great. Um, thank you so much, Alex. We really appreciate you taking the time to walk through the recommendations. It's always nice to um, hear it directly from uh, the authors. Um, we have one more polling question today before we get into the Q&A section. section. Um, and that is an overall question. Uh, we are interested in understanding how likely, um, based on the presentation today and your review of the recommendations, how likely is it that the draft recommendations will um, achieve their purpose um, to uh, increase the predictability and impact of new standards and operating rules for the industry? We sort of have a scale of not likely to extremely likely. We'll give you all a few minutes to complete that poll. Um, it, if you um, do have questions um, for Alex or comments that you would like to share with the group or for a core to think about as we begin um, authoring our comments based on your feedback, um, please do go ahead and submit that in the question panel. And as Jessica said, we'll also have a live Q&A. Um, all right, let's go ahead and um, take a look at the results of the poll. So um, overall, it looks like um, the majority, 58%, uh, felt like it was um, at least somewhat likely, um, with 30%, 33% saying very likely, so a third thing very likely, that these um, draft recommendations would improve, increase the predictability and impact of new standards and operating rules for the industry. Uh, so sounds like uh, generally they are well aligned with where the industry should be headed. With that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Jessica to manage the Q&A and commentary section. Thank you, Aaron, and thank you, April, um, for your presentation. I think um, that was really helpful. Um, so now we'll change gears and have some time for Q&A, followed by open mic. And I want to point out this is a great opportunity to talk to our guest speaker, Alex Goss, and ask her some questions. Um, so if you want to submit your question for the Q&A, you can submit it by entering it into the questions panel on the dashboard. And then after the questions uh, portion, we will move on to open mic, and I'll give you instructions then. So uh, the first question is, um, 
for Alex. Uh, will there be a dial-in or a, 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 a way to participate remotely uh, during the 12, December 12th, 13th hearing? That's a great question. Thank you. The December 12th and uh, 13th hearing will have uh, the ability for folks to listen in. Uh, and hear the activities throughout the day with a public comment period be, um, available. We've elected to have a public comment period, I believe, on both days. Uh, keep me honest, Lorraine Du, who's uh, staff to the standards on the subcommittee, um, I think we made the choice so that uh, folks who may not be able to stay with us the entire day and a half, uh, we wanted to provide for the opportunity for uh, public comment at the end of day one as well as day two. Uh, the uh, the ability to participate in the hearing is based upon invitations, uh, so there, it will not be interactive with those on the web beyond the public comment period. Yeah. Um, thank you, Alex. And since we do seem to have a bit of a shy group uh, with us today, what I'm going to do is go ahead and move on to the open mic. And if people want to use the open mic to comment and or ask questions, uh, we it's perfectly fine to do so. So if you do want to comment, um, please uh, press the, the raise hand button on your panel and that way we will know to unmute your line. So I can only imagine, uh, Alex, the amount of work that it has taken for you all to be at this point where we're gonna, you're going to do a public hearing. Must be a yeah. tremendous <laughs> amount of work. It it has been a tremendous amount of work, um, especially for um, our lead staff. Thank you, Lorraine. Um, a lot of this work is very near and dear to my heart. Um, as a the former chair of the Insurance Subcommittee of X12 and its healthcare task group before that, and also as a member of uh, representative uh, on the DISMO uh, and somebody that helped uh, manage transactions and code code set complaints for the feds. I've been around this for a lot of years and when we started looking at uh, what were the issues, how do we create more predictability because there was a theme that emerged from other hearings that we had within NCVHS, we looked back at the body of work and it really goes back um, to the initial HIPAA implementation days and the lessons learned that came out of that were summarized in a 2006 white paper and a lot of those themes and challenges remained even as we were doing our information gathering in 2017 and 2018. And so I think, you know, it's been it's been a, my pleasure and my honor to be able to work on this topic because what it's about is ensuring that the ecosystem, the village around healthcare, standards development, operating rules, authoring entities, and promulgation efforts are all working together to meet the fast-paced needs of business models and technology, and it's time to modernize. And I think we're at the right inflection point for folks to present their thoughts and ideas about how we should design the next phase. Because we had the best of breed thinking when we designed a lot of this in the mid 90s and you know none of us want to go back to having six versions of a claim or an ERA or the national similar format as opposed to having a there's one version of a claim that we all know that we need to use and build on and so I'm really excited for folks to be able to think about their journey related to HIPAA administrative simplification and bring forward their wish list to us in their written testimony so that we can um, really design the next best of breed. Thank you, Alex. We've, we've had a couple of more questions come in. Um, so one question is, with this accelerated timeline in your proposed recommendations, do you envision that the SDOs and the operating rule authoring entities that their, um, their time frame would also have to accelerate you know, that's a really great question. Um, 
and probably reflects the fact that I didn't say that we we talked to a lot of the, the uh, in the information gathering phase, uh, we talked to each of the organizations. And what we found was that there was sort of a sweet spot about the development timeline. You even saw it with CAQH's cores overview about the 1.5 to 2.0 two years to get from start to finish on an operating role. We found that we can, most organizations, most standards organizations can make that two year mark, no problem. Not everybody can. Um, so one might have a, a, a bigger lift uh, to manage their volunteer resources than others, uh, but the majority of them can. And the, the big feedback was also around, if you don't get the federal processes to improve their ability to, to move their, through the black box process, as I said earlier, all of this is for naught, because that seems to be a large part of the um, uh, timing issue, because we as an industry have really, uh, we tend to react when the federal hammer comes down. Um. That's a great point, Alex. And you know, the next question is a little bit similar, but it's more on the imp implementation portion of this. So if these, if the process is accelerating, um, would that impact the amount of time that the industry has to implement the recommendation or the new standard or the new operating rule? I, that's a really good question, and I'm going to probably call on, on Lorraine Dew to keep me honest here because I think that there is a statute or an obligation to um, uh, provide so much, uh, a minimum uh, amount of implementation time once a regulation is uh, promulgated. So I, I think that there's a little bit of a wild card around there, and I don't know if Lorraine can come off uh, mute to clarify my answer. Uh, all right. Well, to, as the initial standard, oh, am I off mute? Yes, you are. Yep. Cool. Yeah. After the initial standard, there's a, um, you know, so we're permitted then to adopt, you know, annually, and then there's a two-year implementation time frame. But the secretary has some. Le I'm sorry. Um, it can be adopted. I was just going to pull out my reg book. Uh, to read it, but then there can be an implementation time frame of uh, two years after that. So I so think that so the it's not like we would make people adopt within you know six months and say everybody has to be compliant in six months. It doesn't accelerate the requirement for compliance. And as with any set of recommendations that we solicit feedback on, whether it's the federal process or within the federal advisory process, it's always good to be able to comment on things that you're concerned about, even if it's a lot of scope. So whoever submitted that comment, you might want to, you know, if you want to make sure we don't, we still give industry that flexibility, that might be a good comment to include. Right. That's a really good point. Um, Alex, that um, each organization that's on this call, from their own point of view, has the opportunity to provide their feedback. Um, so one uh, last question for you, Alex, and it's uh, regarding call to action C. So um, it's a general question, you know, what for the certification uh, recommendation or call to action, what, what are the things that you all have been thinking about um, for that Call to action. So call to action C was about identifying and funding a best of class third party compliance tool. Uh, we know that um, people like to know whether or not their compliance are, are transactions and operating rules are compliant and that having the testing criteria um, and a way for, for people to do that validation testing is, is very helpful. Um, so uh, we really haven't developed a lot of ideas more around that um, other than to 
really want to look to the industry to give us feedback on how this might work, especially as we start to see more of the convergence around what we do with electronic health records and practice management systems being much more integrated in certain spaces. And what does that really mean for efficiency in the um, provider community um, as you need to think about your EHRs and your practice management, your billing systems, um, I would think that it'd be good for people to think maybe that far down the, the pike. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. And, you know, before we close the open mic and portion of this webinar, I just wanted to give you one last opportunity to, you know, share uh, something uh, you might want to share with this group uh, before I go on to closing. You know, I think I, I appreciate that opportunity a lot. It, the 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 industry has come a long way with uh, coming from a paper claim, a fifteen hundred and a UB, uh, to an, using an eight thirty seven or an NCPDP uh, telecommunication standard. And you know, I, I think that. Uh, we've all had a lot of lessons learned and experiences on trying to make the day-to-day -day reality come to fruition on using um, transactions and operating rules. And uh, we have an opportunity. We have attention of a lot of people in the industry. And I really hope that uh, we can apply not only our HIPAA lessons, but our meaningful use high-tech lessons in envisioning what the future should look like and how we come to agreement on standards and operating rules, how we have more of a leadership role within the industry and can drive the timelines around uh, the national implementation kind of thought process around upgrades and garnering more value so that what we can do is use our dollars and our precious time more wisely to deliver better care uh, and get better outcomes for each of us. Thank you so much, uh, Alex, uh, for putting it into that context. Um, and thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Uh, if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, as Erin mentioned, uh, CHQH Core is going to be um, collecting feedback for testimony for the hearing that NCVHS will be conducting in December. Uh, in preparation for that testimony, we're going to be using not only the polling results from our webinar today, but we also uh, want to get even more input from all of you. So we're going to send out a survey on Thursday, and we would like your responses by the following Friday, so November 16th. We'll send that to you as a Qualtrics survey. It should be uh, fairly simple. We'll include some detailed instructions and also the material that you will need in order to be able to answer the survey. So look up for that survey from us in the next few days. Um, and then once the testimony has been completed, we will make sure to publish it on our website so that you can see um, that. Uh, so let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and so with that, um, I would like to thank not only our guest speaker, but also uh, all of our participants for joining us today. And if you have any questions or comments, uh, you know how to find us uh, on that email core at ch2h.org. Thank you very much. Have a great afternoon.